some viewers may find the following video disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. Well, hello, and welcome back to the channel, everybody. I got another installment of the Craig Hendry saga right here, as uh, apparently he went to court a couple days ago, and, uh, well, this is his little report, and he also tries to impress us all with his knowledge of, well, his supposed knowledge of law, which seems to fall flat on his face because, well, he has a very limited and narrow view of what the law is, as we shall soon see. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get this freaking S show on the road, shall we? Hello, everybody. My name is Craig Hendry, citizen journalist reporting from the Vermilion County, Indiana jail. Today's date is November 1st, 2024. And the reason for this report is that I had court today, and it was a very eventful court hearing. I'd like to transmit some of the information that I gathered there to all of you so that you can be better informed. First off, I'm going to start out with uh, saying that at court there was numerous deputies that were there. I don't know what the purpose of their presence was. It seemed to me an attempt to intimidate me and or anybody who would be there to support me. And here we go, already starting off with the persecution rhetoric, uh, Craig. It really doesn't uh, uh, fit with the narrative that you're being persecuted, considering that this is a courthouse, and courthouses require security guards. I mean, between the two of you, you admit that there were probably about a dozen officers throughout that courthouse that you saw. Maybe there were other things going on, or maybe there was need for security, or anything else for that matter. I mean, you'll always see police officers in a courthouse, no matter what. I mean, come on now, get freaking real. Tyler is the one that is, uh, you know, Tyler is the one that is making this phone call possible. He's on the other line. So I'm going to ask Tyler to estimate how many police officers, how many sheriff's deputies he saw inside the courthouse. Tyler, could you give the people a estimate? What, what's your best guess at how many uh, police officers were there? Yeah, so in the lobby, there was probably about four or five. And up at the court, in the courtroom, I've seen about the same amount, about four or five other officers. So there's quite a bit, about 10 or so, maybe a dozen. I, okay, so that that's Tyler. That's I, I am about the same. I think that there probably was about a dozen law enforcement officers there uh, for nothing. You know, we, They know that we're peaceful. They know that we are not violent. So their presence is, in my opinion, it can only be seen as an attempt to intimidate or they might have had other duties that brought them to that courthouse at that particular time. And it just may be one big coincidence that you saw them there. Oh boy, you are taking this victim complex of yours to a whole new level, dude. Now, I want to get into a few things that happened in one of my last phone call updates. I said that the prosecution was attempting to get my criminal history put into evidence. And I posit that this is just an attempt to put me on trial for my personality and my criminal history, not for the actual events that occurred in question, in the times in question in this case. Well, I can understand why you wouldn't want that in there to begin with, because it shows an ongoing history of your acts against the community, your acts against everybody around you, and it would show that you're not being persecuted at all. You're not a victim. You're nothing but a career criminal. So, of course, you wouldn't want it in there because it wouldn't fit with your narrative when you're trying to present your case to the jury. Of course not. The case is a stalking case. It has two misdemeanor counts of harassment along with it. And so I have to defend against these charges. But if they paint me as some sort of a criminal or as some sort of a, uh, you know, a, a crazy, it'll be very difficult to convince a jury that, you know, well, look, if, if he do all this stuff, you know, why wouldn't he, uh, you know, why wouldn't he be doing all this other stuff as well? That would essentially be putting me on trial for my past and not for the 
for the events in question. So... Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, so you do understand it, but you know what? You have never atoned for your past or anything like that. You continue to commit crimes all the damn time and get away with it. But you know what? Your time is coming, boy. One of these days, you're going to st- cross the line, and they're really going to bring down the hammer on you. Uh, the judge asked a few questions to the prosecutor regarding entering my criminal history into evidence and my attorney Elizabeth Smith who has been a real trooper throughout this whole case argued against having my criminal history included the prosecution made such claims as uh, you know what he wants to do is he wants to include a conviction for drug dealing which is a conviction for marijuana dealing on my part I have two marijuana convictions Uh, It is still illegal to deal and to buy and consume marijuana in the state of Indiana. So the other conviction is a domestic violence or a domestic battery conviction that occurred at some time in the recent past. But that is an issue between me and my girlfriend. My girlfriend is still with me. We have two beautiful children. And we have worked out our differences despite the state trying to pry us apart at every turn. You know, Craig, what you consider prying apart, uh, everybody else with a brain would consider looking out for the welfare of the mother and the children that you brought into this world, and, well, you seem to have no regard for the safety of whatsoever. And, you know, I've known several women that have been in this very same situation with domestic battery going on with their significant other. And some of them escaped, but others did not. And, well, it didn't end very well for the women that did stay. They either were crippled or worse. Of course, Erica didn't press the charges. The state did. So, anyways, they they made a claim that Well, there's a ton of other convictions as well, Your Honor. We're just including these ones because we think that they're relevant. And, of course, the relevancy of them is, you know, it's unquestionable. It's not relevant at all. But the claim that there's many other, that there's countless other convictions is an outright lie. He has taken three out of my four convictions. I've got four convictions. The three that I've mentioned previously and a conviction for OVWI, which is operating a vehicle while intoxicated. So those are my four convictions. Yeah, that's four convictions right there. Four convictions that show you have a history of, well, being a rather nasty fellow. But wait, he's about to say that many of his charges were dismissed. And, uh, well, the argument uh, to that would be that a dismissal is not a victory. They can bring it back any time to put you away. And I've seen it before with people that I know who will claim the same thing. And guess what? These prior uh, dismissals came back and bit them in the ass. Every other case against me has been dismissed. I mean, I've got so many dismissals, I can't even count. Right? But I can count my convictions on one hand. Right? There's four of them. <laughs> So, anyway, he's just making outright lies to the court in, att- in an attempt to paint me in a bad light. But this is to be expected. Right? This is to be expected from these prosecutors. They have no regard for our rights. They have no regard for the law. That would be the Constitution. Hey, giblet head, the Constitution in any state or even the uh, United States Constitution is just one piece of the law. You just can't say it's only the Constitution and move on from there. Uh, nope. Uh, in fact, that's going to come back to bite you in the ass later in this video. They only have a regard for their own power. So uh, my attorney made many arguments, many sound arguments. Um, you know, she, she basically argued that look, this, this is certainly a distracting piece of information to give to jurors and that it's a subjective piece of evidence which uh, Indiana law and Indiana trial rules prohibit the admission of it. The state refused to rebut when the judge gave them a chance. So now we're going to move on to another hearing that happened on a motion that the prosecutor made. I believe he called it a motion for direction. He was basically asking for direction from the court. He began making vague references to the phone call updates me and Tyler have been making together to bring to you. 
who we've been working together to bring to you. It seemed as though he wanted Tyler to provide him with something, uh, like a recording of his. My attorney pointed out correctly that any recording Tyler is in possession of, the state is also in possession of, as this facility that I'm at records all phone calls, and they are actually most likely listening right now. The prosecutor, Bruce Ackerman, continually referenced the, my use of the word kidnapping on these phone calls, expressing his displeasure, but conceding that I have a right to its use. Right? The judge mostly waived this off, but did say that he will most likely allow my telephone recordings to be used in evidence should the prosecutor choose to do so. We then moved on to the issue of a bond. And here comes the most juicy part. Uh, this is the part where he uh, tries to use the Constitution to try to say that his bond is illegal and everything like that. When he fails to realize, like I said before, that it is just one piece of the puzzle. And, uh, well, Indiana does have laws concerning that. Uh, this topic is the main topic, as I am being held in in Vermilion County, Indiana, without bond. Right? So I, I've got written down here a few things that are absolutely necessary to understand the, the uh, illegitimacy of me being held without bond. So first I'm going to read off the statute that defines bail bond. Right? So as used in this chapter, bail bond means, quote, a... A bond executed by a person who has been arrested for the commission of an offense for the purposes of ensuring, one, the person's appearance at the appropriate legal proceeding, two, another person's physical safety, or three, the safety of the community. You know, I love uh, fraudulent hypocrisy. Uh, Craig has pretty much stated that uh, statutes are not laws in the past and everything like that. He only believes that the Constitution, the Indiana Constitution, applies to him because, you know, it's more convenient. But here he is accurately reading the uh, Indiana statute regarding this. This is a bit of a hypocrisy on his part because he probably thinks that this benefits him when it really doesn't. And I'll explain why here in a minute. So there's three reasons that, that uh, you know, a bail bond would be instituted. There is no Indiana statute dictating when a judge must hold or release a defendant on bond. Thus, much discretion is given to judges when deciding such things. However, there are only three legitimate reasons, according to law, that a jurist should deny bond to a defendant in criminal proceedings. Indeed, in every case in which there exists an absence of these three aforementioned reasons, Indiana defendants have, quote, a constitutional right to a bail bond. Right. And that's, from, that's quoted from case law. I don't have a case exactly right now, but I'll go on. The Indiana Constitution, Article 1, Section 17, reads as follows, quote, Offenses other than murder or treason shall be bailable by sufficient sureties. Murder or treason shall not be bailable when the proof is evident or the presumption strong, unquote. So, in other words, uh, you know, offenses other than murder or treason shall be ba bailable. Right. This is in the Constitution. This provides a constitutional right to bail uh, for Hoosiers. It's a, it's a, actually, it's a constitutional right that many other states don't have and that the U.S. Constitution does not provide for. While no law explicitly exists in Indiana Code, the Constitution is the law in itself. Now, Craig uh, fails to mention uh, something else in this video. Uh, yeah, there is a statute within uh, Indiana law that pretty much uh, summarizes where he has gone wrong in this particular scenario. And thus, here is the particular statute that uh, old Craig uh, failed to mention right here regarding bail in the state of Indiana. Uh, pay close attention to... Uh, 
sections C and E. I mean, our boy here is a habitual offender, and no matter what excuse he has for his failure to appear, the fact remains he does have a history of failure to appear, and, uh, well, he will argue that he was in other uh, jails at that particular time, which really doesn't help his argument one bit, considering that continues to show that he is a habitual offender and uh, is a flight risk in addition to, well, he's just an all-around idiot to begin with. However, case law does exist that offers some guidelines to jurists with regards to bond. In Sam versus State, this is 893 Northeast 2nd District 761, this is the, the court citation, the Indiana Court of Appeals made clear that, quote, the object of bail is not to affect punishment in advance of conviction as it is being used in my case. So I'm going to start over because I started as a quote. So, quote, the object of bail is not to affect punishment in advance of conviction. Rather, it is to ensure the presence of the accused when required without the hardship of incarceration before guilt has been proved and while the presumption of innocence is to be given effect, unquote. So just analyzing that quote, one can see that I've never had a failure to appear charge. I've never, well, sorry, I've never had a failure to appear conviction. Because any time I failed to appear, it was because another state actor had kidnapped me in another section of the state. Well, not counting your uh, misidentification of the uh, term kidnapping, uh, your uh, argument here is total BS. I mean, it doesn't matter how you uh, fail to appear, and I'm uh, certain that uh, many of your failure to appears were not caused by your incarceration in other areas of the state, because you know what? You're just that type of person that would skip out on a court hearing because you don't believe in the law to begin with. And that is proven by the fact that I ended up finding that statute for you because you outright lied about its existence. And I wasn't able to appear because I was in their cage. So I've never been convicted of that. I always show up dressed extremely nice, clean shaven. Tyler, Tyler, will you attest to that? I mean, you know, I, I always show up very nice. Absolutely. Anyway. If anything, you show up early. And you always make sure you're dressed nice, definitely. Absolutely. And therefore, in the case involving me, it is clear that bond should, should only be denied if I pose a flight risk, as there is no claim from anyone around that I am dangerous to anybody or the community. Right? And so when we look at if I'm a flight risk, I'm clearly not. So in my opinion, and in the opinion of the Indiana Court of Appeals, I would, I would posit, me being denied bail is a punitive measure, meaning it's a measure to punish me prior to conviction. And I disagree with it wholeheartedly. I, I expect the trial to go on whether I'm on bond or not. And so I believe that the judge in this case, Hunter Reese, who did seem to me to be fairly neutral in such a case, but he is employed by the state. He has a history of being employed by the state. And... Uh, but either way, uh, you know, he seemed very neutral to me, but he ignored these facts, uh, which I assume he knows, right? Courts are presumed to know the law. So I can only presume that he knew the law and that he decided to ignore it in this case, as my attorney did not make arguments as uh, I just presented to you. Well, of course your attorney didn't make those stupid little arguments because your attorney knows the law better than you do, and... Uh... Well, they are trying to help you out. But, of course, if you continue to use uh, the term kidnapping and everything like that, it will hurt you in your case. Uh, and especially if they do use your history against you, which I presume they will, considering I've seen that happen numerous times, then uh, it's all going to come down on your head in the long run. But at any rate, uh, this video has pretty much come to its conclusion. Uh, and after this, he thanks his uh, uh, followers and everything like that. So let's just go ahead and call it on this video. At any rate, I hope you guys enjoyed the video to begin with, and I will see you on the next one. This could be some groundbreaking stuff right here.
Dude, so there's no way I can get in, bro? Come on, I'll put you on my YouTube. But shut up, Wesley. You gotta put signs up, ma'am, if it's... Are you Glenn Serio? Who's that?